Now, yes, I know that this looks like an awful lot of men working in one spot, and it is. But what you're not seeing and what you don't know is that we are pouring the back patio today as well. That work will be shown in another video. But both places are going to receive an exposed aggregate finish. So both areas are going to start out slow and end with a horse race. Bottom line is that even though we're tripping over each other right now, in just a couple of hours, it will be all hands on deck with everybody working at full capacity. The first part of this pour is pretty routine. We're pumping the concrete, like I almost always do. The concrete, like it always is, is provided by Umpqua Sand and Gravel, concrete service. It's a 3 8 exposed aggregate mix design, and that means small rocks in a slightly different proportion. It also has stealth fiber in the mix, which you'll hear about later, and it was ordered at a 5 inch slump. The pump operator and the finishers are completely absorbed with taking care of the concrete. But I'm not entirely just sitting back and making a pest of myself either. I'm actually filling the job of pour watch, which means monitoring and ensuring the straightness of the forms. I do this by leaving a string line tight, really tight, at the top of the forms and monitoring it closely. So if the form starts to bow out with the mud in place, I can spot it, force it back, and keep that form line true. Now the turnbuckles are terrific for this. They're the best. But just a short board, a square stake, a hammer and a nail can work just about as well. I've got to have all my forming tools close at hand and ready to deploy at a moment's notice because right now, moments count. Don't be distracted by the height of this porch. There's going to be a sidewalk along the front leading up to a couple of steps. And also, as you've probably figured out, the grade, or the dirt, is going to be raised up a lot by the time this is finished and the landscaping is in place. But this introduces one of the first and most challenging decisions involved with building a house, or anything else for that matter. It's this. you got to decide how high the structure is going to sit the elevation of the finished floor. You gotta visualize the whole house in your mind's eye. The door locations, the patios, the walks, the driveways, always bearing in mind the question, where is the water gonna go? In general, the best rule is, higher is better. But whatever you pick, once you've picked it, there is no going back.
set of stairs like this takes a lot of extra attention, and we have Tom here taking care of it. In addition to having a uniform finish on the treads and on the faces, the steps themselves need to slope so that the water can run off. Now initially this is done with the forms, but a good stair finisher is double checking as he's getting the concrete in shape. You've got to have a level nearby to make sure you're keeping everything correct and in tolerance as you strip and face the still soft concrete. Oh, we have to do it the next day and use a pressure locker. The crack control aspect on this slab is being done very carefully with this torpedo groover. These tools come in different lengths for different applications and are just a huge improvement over more traditional jointer groovers. They make a very deep, very straight control joint that will catch the cracks and hide them in the bottom of these neatly finished lines. Besides the crack control aspect, the grooves become a design feature in themselves to sort of break up the appearance and add interest. In fact, this is a big enough deal that I determined the locations of all these joints, along with Dustin, well before we even scheduled the pour date. This is one of those cases where form and function are equal priorities. Now you're going to be able to see the wooden reveal strips that were fastened to the face of the form in order to match the look and placement of the grooves on the top when we pull the form off of the face in just a few minutes. The really technical aspect of this pour is the 52 linear feet of two foot high vertical face. They have to be removed at the right moment. I mean, the right moment. You judge the timing of when to take the forms off by the hardness of the concrete at the top. I tend to figure that if the top is about as hard as the back of my hand, it might be about time. But here's the bottom line. If you take the forms off too soon, the slab is going to slump down under its own weight. If you take them off too late, you're not going to have enough time to finish that vertical face before it gets too darn hard. Let me tell you, now is the moment that a big, capable crew of strong, experienced, conscientious finishers is such a giant relief.
look at that. Now, everybody got a good laugh when we saw this spreader block that had been buried during the general confusion of the initial pour. It's a relatively easy fix, as you will see, but it's a good opportunity to describe something important about concrete. Generally speaking, you want to disrupt the mud as little as possible once it hits the forms and takes an initial set. As concrete hardens, it forms crystal structures inside the mix that provide the strength. When concrete is moved around after the chemical reaction is well started, those crystals may not be able to reform as uniformly as in the adjacent material, and you're going to end up with what's known as a cold joint. Now there's nothing structural about this part of our patio, right? So this little patch is going to be just fine even though I didn't add any additional glue or bonding agent. But if this problem was part of an important brace on a bridge or something, this little 2x4 could be a real deal killer. Okay, that's going to be behind steps. There's, there's going to be uh, the other sidewalks coming right in here someplace, either top or there. So that to side, that joint though? Yeah. yeah, to the joint. I mean the joint's going to be the edge of it. So that's... that's The second reason that this is a more technical pour is the finish. What you're watching is step three of an exposed aggregate finish. Now the word aggregate refers to the rocks inside the mix. So think of this as an exposed rock finish. It has about five different steps in order to accomplish it. Step one was ordering the right concrete. Step two is getting it in place and smooth without any trowel lines. And step three is exposing the rocks. And once again, timing is critical. So Dustin is spraying a medium deep etch surface retarder onto the whole thing. He's really soaking it in. The retarder stops the chemical reaction of the concrete at the surface, about an eighth of an inch deep. The smooth gray paste at the top is going to remain soft while the concrete below it gets harder and harder. Once the concrete below the surface is hard enough to hold on to the rocks to keep them in place, the top is gently brushed down and a light spray of water rinses off the dead sand and cement slurry. It's tricky to expose the rocks evenly without either overexposing that is, digging too deep into the concrete and making rocks fall out, or underexposing, that is, not exposing deep enough so that you can't actually see all of the rocks. Either of those is a mistake, and the upshot is that this is not near as simple as it looks, and a moment's inattention can cause a heartache for sure.
Now you don't have to use a commercial surface retarder. Any water solution that contains a lot of sugar will retard the chemical reaction of concrete. A pint of molasses in a couple of gallons of water is one mix that I've used a lot and I like it. But some folks use sugar water only. The commercial stuff is convenient. You pick it up, there's no mixing at home, you get to the job, it's ready to go, and you can always be assured of an even etch. Yeah, this is, uh, they call it stealth fiber, and that's where I don't know how well you pick it up even on the camera. It's very, very, very small. And uh, we can see it here in the wash, though starting to ball up on some of these points on the leading edge. Most of the fibers are designed for strength. This fiber is incredibly small, so that it pretty much has no structural value. Oh, yeah. But uh, what's neat is when they make it, they can't even cut it this thin. Um, so they actually, it's uh, cut and then it's stretched. And so the byproduct of that is uh, there's a, a negative static electrical charge and the water will bead to it. What? So while the concrete's hydrating, this is gonna help um, by keeping moisture for a longer period of time. Wow. And then another byproduct of it for what we're doing um, is it doesn't add a tremendous amount, but it does give some more um, Oh, interlock on the aggregate. Mm -hmm. So when we're peeling the face, we can actually peel it and finish it just a fraction sooner. So it's still mm. softer. Mm. Uh, you know, we had our hands full today. Mm. So that let us get about probably only 15 minute head start. Well, what do you, when you order, what do you call that when you're calling in an order? Stealth fiber. Stealth fiber. Yeah. And so here I'll, I'll rent some of this. Maybe with the camera, you can kind of pick it up and, and see it a little more clearly instead of it all being balled up. I can't tell. <laughs> well, it's called stealth. They don't have to take our word for it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you, we can you, see it all in piles out there. Yeah, after they bundle, but I know they're so small independently until they start to gather, it's hard hmm. to pick up on them. And it's nothing to do with strength, it's just uh, so you can kind of get on it a little quicker and... That's the byproduct why we're using it. Yeah. Um, it does, it helps with early age, uh, what they call crazing. Hmm. It is actually, you know, many, many reasons for craft. Uh, and this, one of them is, is uh, crazing, which you'll see in high winds or high heat situations. At least that's where we see it. Hmm. Um, and it, it does help prevent some of that. Uh, but the fact that it, it holds the moisture um, and I can strip a little sooner is mostly why I use it. Hmm. The last two steps in producing an exposed aggregate finish will be shown and explained in another episode in our series. We have several more concrete pours left to accomplish here, 
and a few more tricks up our sleeves. If you're interested in the other aspects of this project, we've got a lot of videos from earlier in the series here covering pretty much everything if you'd be interested in checking them out. Thank you for watching Essential Craftsman and keep up the good work. Concrete got here at 7, 3 p.m. right now. <laughs>